Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's uh, seminar. Uh, this is Dee Miles, and we're especially uh, pleased to be able to uh, uh, have our uh, seminar tonight. Um, we This is the start of a four-part series, and uh, I will not uh, delay. I'll turn uh, the mic over to our presenter tonight, uh, Mark Brodine. Mark. Thank you, Dee. Um, I've enjoyed working with Dee on the committee, which has uh, been working on the draft program along with several other comrades. We've been working on it for about six months. Uh, we've had discussions and input in the national board and the national committee. Um, we started with the previous version uh, so that we didn't weren't starting from scratch. And we also noted that one of the main criticisms of the previous one was its length. And uh, so we, we made some adjustments to respond to that criticism, but everybody is not happy with the way we've approached it. So the point of this process, of the whole pre-convention process, is to uh, give a chance for the, the whole party and our friends to be involved in discussing our strategy, the sort of the broad outlines of how we see moving from where we are uh, all the way to socialism and uh, to have a chance to discuss and debate and uh, fine tune some of the wording and um, one of the, it, I sort of think as of the of the program as a handle. Uh, often in the press of current events and uh, momentous tasks ahead of us and very threatening developments and very encouraging developments, it's hard to step back from that and uh, think about these sort of uh, the grand strategy that we need to have if we're going to connect what we're doing now to our vision of socialism. So the program and discussing it and arguing about it and thinking about it and wrestling with the concepts is the, the, the is gives us a handle to have that kind of discussion, which we need to have, not every single meeting, but uh, we, we need to not wait uh, too many years between. So it's been uh, 13, 14 years since the last program was adopted. Um, and I'm going to take you through an introduction to the draft and then talk about uh, mainly some issues of class struggle and democratic struggle and how they interrelate. And there will be opportunities for questions and comments at several points through the discussion. And uh, at, at the end, we'll have more opportunity to continue the discussion, presumably presuming I don't talk too long. So some of the goals for today's presentation are to introduce the program, which will be adopted uh, as amended by our 100th anniversary convention, um, to share some of the priorities that shaped the creation of the draft, um, to help start the pre-convention discussion, and uh, to share ways to discuss the concepts in the draft and how to best to propose amendments and edits. So our last program was adopted in 2005, and there's obviously been some history between then and now. The 2008 Great Recession, the Obama presidency, the uh, election or ascension of Donald Trump, and a rising danger of fascism, and these there's also these new and changing developments, the rising fascist danger not only here, but uh, in many ways worldwide, especially in parts of Europe. There's growing attacks on the right to vote, growing environmental crises, uh, and economic recovery that hasn't seen workers' wages grow, uh, but has seen almost all the benefits flow to the top 1%. And most importantly, there are growing progressive and resistance movements. The biggest demonstrations ever in our history, um, uh, it, sort of numerous struggles against all the attacks that are being made against our democratic and civil rights. So we have needed to update our program to match it to today's circumstances, to reflect the changes that are happening around us, and by having a realistic program of working towards fundamental transformation, we can offer people hope, a way for people to understand the path that we're on and how they can join us so new members know what they're committing to 
uh, can understand what our strategic outlook is. And so that we make clear how to connect the struggles in the present with long range goals of the current reform struggles and defensive struggles with revolutionary struggle. Uh, and I think that that's one of the uh, big tasks for us because it's easy for people to want things to move faster and they ought to move faster, but uh, we have to understand the process of change and the stages of struggle and change. There's many things about the program that stay the same. The main element of our strategy has not changed. Uh, building a popular people's front against the extreme right. Uh, it's also true that we continue our focus on the working class, class struggle, and the working class as the center of a broad people's movement. Uh, we also continue to insist on the centrality of the fight against racism as essential for building class unity and mass unity. Uh, how to build unity between the working class and the other core forces for progress. Uh, African Americans, Mexican Americans, and other oppressed people, women and youth. Uh, it also stays the same that we see the democratic struggle as the broadest framework for unity. We project, continue to project the next major stage of struggle after the current one as an anti-monopoly struggle, uh, a struggle to unite all against uh, the monopolies who control the economy uh, and in some ways the international economy. It also stays the same that our, our goal is still socialism and Marxism is our anchor. But there are some things that are different in addition to just noting historical developments. We have tried to create an introduction that can be published as the much shorter version of our basic strategy, which is the way we try to address the criticism that the program was too long for popular use. Uh, we, Some people thought we could just do something that was 30 pages long, but that would cut out a lot of the complexity. We have a big country, a complex country, and there are a lot of issues. And if we uh, we give treat them in a shorthand fashion, that, that'll be unsatisfying too. But we wanted to try and create an introduction that would be a summary of uh, the whole program so that that could be published separately and given it to um, contacts and friends and prospective members. We've updated the references. We've given more attention to the growing environmental crises, more emphasis to the growing fascist danger. Uh, we've changed the descriptor ultra-right to extreme right, added the concept of a socialist bill of rights to our emphasis on bill of rights, socialism, and democratic struggle. And I think we make an effort to better explain the connection between our current stage of struggle and the goal of socialism. Our aim with the introduction uh, to the draft was to write a short summary version of our whole basic strategy uh, while leaving the details and supporting arguments for the main text so that it could be published separately. So that um, while we've tried to eliminate repetition between the introduction and the main text, there's of necessity quite a bit of overlap since they have to cover the same subjects. We've tried to get rid of that, but we have not succeeded in, uh, in totally doing so. Um, I do want to note for people that uh, because we don't have enough published material, because there's all kinds of uh, subjects that people want us to cover or styles of communicating, uh, that sometimes people look at the draft and they want it to be all things to all people, and it can't. Um, it can't fulfill all our needs for publications and explanations. So we don't want to wait the, the program, the eventual uh, final program with the expectation that it can solve all of our publication needs or writing needs. So in the introduction, here is the balance that we tried to strike was between uh, having, you know, something that was just a short introduction that was more inspirational or something that was could be used as a standalone summary of our whole strategy. If we keep it, as a summary of the whole strategy, it's drier and less inspirational and a little bit more stodgy maybe. 
uh, and it covers most of the subjects of the main text. So it's complex and, um, and detailed, and it's uh, a little bit unwieldy. However, if we go for a more short inspirational introduction to the program, it won't work as well or at all as a standalone piece. Um, and we'll have the same problem as we had the last time where everybody felt that the introduction, that the whole program was much too long and there wasn't any piece of it that could be used as a popular piece for the people that we're working with who don't necessarily want to read a long detailed thing. They just want an introduction and a summary. So that's the balance where we have to strike. Um, some people like the introduction as a standalone summary um, and as an introduction to our whole strategy. Um, some like it as a standalone but want it to be more inspirational and less of a summary, but then it wouldn't be a real introduction to the strategy. Some want it to be more inspirational and shorter and uh, not repeat stuff in the main text, more like the introduction to the last version of the program. So uh, for those of you who've, who've read it and thought about this, what do you think? Um, we've had uh, people express all of these different opinions and that's part of what the pre-convention discussion is about is to help us strike the right balance so what do you think the right balance would be i uh, the, the floor will be open for uh you know for maybe we'll take maybe five minutes of discussion of this so i'm looking for i right now mark all right now oh, okay all right, the floor is open for discussion. And uh, if you'd like to speak, just click uh, the picture of the hand. Click, uh, use your mouse clicker and uh, click the picture of the hand and I'll know uh, you want to uh, speak. Yeah, and this is just about the introduction. We'll go on to more of the, the meat of it uh, later. Scott, your your mic is open. Hi, this is Scott. Um, I I appreciate the uh, the contradictory sort of demands of of producing something like this introduction that it you know it needs to have some real analytical meat, but also enough uh, uh, flair or, or or whatever to capture people. Um, but um, I'm not sure that it's a like an either or. Like either we can produce an inspirational document or we can produce an analytical one. Um, this is a, a tension that's been, uh, you know, even reading, you know, looking at, at uh, Marx's writing or at Lenin's writing, um, you, you can feel in the tone that tension between the kind of analytical and polemical, you might say, or the, the, inspir the fiery inspiration and the, the scientific analysis. So, um, yeah, I, I guess I just, uh, maybe a, a reminder that it's not one or the other, that we, we the finding the balance means doing both of those mm -hmm. things, as, as difficult and, and, and daunting as that is. And I don't envy anyone that task. Thanks. Thanks. Yousef, your mic is open. Yousef, you have to open your, Yousef Gersey. You have to open your mic on your end. Just click it and you can speak. We don't hear you. Click your mic and you can speak. Yusuf S. Yusuf Beta. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, one short, one, I think, uh, important uh, demand um, uh, that should be included is uh, that the uh, powers of Congress be expanded greatly. Uh, so I think uh, that should be included. And the minor uh, quibble is that uh, New Jersey uh, has a, a very important, uh, uh, more than actually New York State, uh, Middle Eastern uh, population. Okay. Uh, let's not forget that um, with the main rallying cry of the Bolshevik Revolution was all power to the Soviets. And uh, so all gra anything uh, grassroots, like the uh, 
uh, House of Representatives, I think it should be uh, expanding their uh, 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 power uh, should be one of our goals, explicitly. Thank you. Okay, again, if you'd like to speak, use your the picture of, your, of the hand. Mark Gruenberg, your mic is open. Hey, yeah, thank you for um, the introduction. I would just uh, agree with Scott with one additional thing. There's the old radio saying, keep it simple. Uh, we can do both. Uh, you can both be inspirational in the introduction and you can get into the details. It might take a couple, it might take say one or two bullets <laughs> for, the, for the inspirational part and then text, bullet, text, bullet, text. But the whole point is to keep it simple, just like as the gentleman before me just said, uh, the revolution had very simple slogans and that appealed to the people and we need to do the same thing. Okay. Uh, there's nothing else. I can move yeah, on. There is one more. Okay. Michael, your your mic is open. Yes, uh, this is Mike Weinecker. Hey, I was just wondering uh, whether then having just one piece like that where you have the introduction, maybe you should have the introduction as an introduction to the piece. Would it be possible to do that kind of the old-fashioned way? But then later on do a pamphlet or some other type of material summarizing the whole thing in simple language as a separate type of entity. So that would be maybe a recommendation I would make about mm -hmm. that. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Okay. okay. Well, yes. Well, this is, uh, this is, I appreciate your efforts to help us wrestle with this problem. And this is not just a problem for the committee, but a problem for all of us to help find that balance and find how to unify these. Um, uh, they're, 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 they're not identical, they're not conflicting, but we have to work on the balance. So the other uh, pieces that I'm going to talk about mostly are class struggle and democratic struggle. Um, the, the, we think of the class struggle as fundamental because it's rooted in the basic economic division of society into classes, and it has basic contradictions that capitalism cannot solve, among them being that the workers who get paid less are the same consumers capitalism needs to keep buying more. And that's that's an insoluble contradiction. The, the consumers and the workers are ultimately the same people uh, in a macro sense. Uh, another is that capitalist economics requires infinite growth, growth, constant growth in commodities, sales, markets, profits, uh, resources. However, the real world and its resources are finite, and those don't match. And that's one of the pieces of the environmental puzzle. So these, these are some of the basic economic contradictions at the heart of capitalism that it cannot resolve. Uh, it's The class struggle is fundamental because the working class will continue to be oppressed and exploited until the capitalist class is overthrown. And also because workers are the only force with enough potential power to create fundamental transformation in the economic system. Um, the class struggle, we don't think of, some people think of it, well, it means strikes or it means mass demonstrations of workers, but the class struggle is really varied. Uh, it includes, but is not limited to resistance at workplaces over safety, breaks, speed up working conditions. It includes strike struggles over wages, benefits, pensions, health care, working conditions. Uh, in the case of teachers especially, not only, but especially teachers, strikes often include demands which help others beyond those who are just members. For example, teachers' demands for uh, classroom supplies and time to plan and uh, uh, smaller class sizes are not things just for the teachers, therefore the students and for the community as a whole. 
There are efforts to organize the unorganized, uh, union campaigns, fight for 15 coalitions, fast food workers, social media groups connecting workers who have trouble organizing on the job, worker centers. There are legislative battles on uh, directly class issues to raise the minimum wage, to guarantee pensions, family leave, uh, sick leave, other kinds of things. There are indeed mass workers demonstrations. There are unions joining in coalition with other progressive forces over a broad range of issues and candidates. And that's up to and including general strikes, which we've seen some of some of in this country, but not for a long time. But it's one of the things we can learn from workers internationally, where there are some have been some a very widespread and in some cases very successful general strikes. So the basic power of workers resides in their ability to slow work down, to resist speed up, to work to rule. It resides in their ability to stop work which stops production, it stops the creation of profit, and it stops the creation of surplus value, which capitalists use to pay interest to the banks, rent and mortgage payments to the banks, dividends to stockholders. The power of workers can create bottlenecks in economic activity, and this is especially true of transportation workers. When railroad workers struck in 1948 or 49, Truman nationalized the railroads and had the National Guard try and run the railroads for a few days. Uh, in, during the George W. Bush administration, he personally intervened when uh, there was a West Coast longshoreman threatened to strike and the employers uh, uh, locked them out and he uh, uh, felt the need to step in immediately because of the Potent, potential repercussions for the economy as a whole of such a strike. Or more recently, during the government shutdown that we just finished, uh, when airport workers slowed and stopped fights, flights into LaGuardia, that was not the only pressure, but one of the key pressures that resulted in the end of that shutdown. And another power of workers is to inspire other workers to do the same. When the Flint, Flint, Flint sit-down strike happened in uh, 1937, I believe, it inspired workers all over the country. And so that there's a ripple effect from workers' struggles, uh, which cause all of the other things that I've talked about to, to happen. And we have to do understand also that workers' organizations are not just unions. It's not just the labor movement. The labor movement is the biggest and the uh, most uh, protracted and long-lasting and institutional of these. But there are worker centers, contact groups, some of these I've mentioned before, student labor coalitions. We have to think about all of them as ways in which workers can organize and impact uh, the class struggle. So I wanted to ask if there are, uh, take another few minutes to talk about examples from your own experience about the power of workers or limits or things that get in the way of working class unity. So I would like to open the floor again for some personal examples or personal thoughts on uh, that power. I'll, I'll share one personal example for me. I had, I had, uh, been a member of the party for a long time, a union activist for a long time. Uh, but in some ways, this talk about the power of the working class seemed a bit theoretical to me. And when I went to Solidarity Day in 1981, there were 500,000 workers marching together. And how it felt to me was that when we chanted, the building shook. And that power that resides in the working class wasn't theoretical at all. It was a very real, tangible thing that I felt in my body. The, the, everything shook. You could hear it with tens of thousands of people chanting. So that was one of my experiences that convinced me that it uh, this wasn't just a, a theory or a, an idea about ha how to change things. It was a palpable, real force. But let me open the floor for a few other examples. Shirley, your mic is open. Shirley, Briggs. thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, my belief, what gets in the way of working class unity is fear of retribution from the owner class. 
also distrust and maybe not um, confident that we as the working class can actually, although there's countless examples historically and now that we can uh, come together and build a more just society, there's still that fear because it's constantly drilled into us. Uh, know your place. And also, maybe this has already been, I, I just recently joined, but also racism. Mm -hmm. You know, um, many people will say that uh, Trump supporters voted against their economic interests. Yeah, they did. But they also, that they voted in favor of hearing white supremacy whistles. And that's what they identify, they want to identify more with that than looking at what they may have in common with Latinos or uh, African Americans and others. That's what I think. That's that's just my comment. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm so glad to be a part of this. Thank you. Click your click your raised hand icon if you'd like to speak. Norma, I'm opening your mic. Norma, your mic is open. Hi. Thanks. Hi there. Thanks, as always, for these presentations. Um, I've only just begun to scan the readings. Uh, and again, I find in this document, as in many of our documents, that it's just a linguistic uh, problem. We talk about them instead of us. Um, we talk about their, T-H-E-I-R, instead of our. I think the document needs to be run through and move that language into us and our, these are our struggles. We, we say the working class, uh, we're not separate from the working class. We're, th those are us. Mm -hmm. uh, further, I want to, as far as uh, uh, personal experiences, this is all organizing. I, I don't get out much to do that. I, I, uh, various things limit how much I do. But um, all discussions, struggles, documents, so forth, need to include the further objective that our struggle has when, when, you, when the building shakes because all the people are out there together. Do they have any body to their rage? <laughs> and people got to stop saying don't hate because we got to hate our owning class. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, all the discussions uh, need to include the further objective in such a way as to affirm people's intention to make and live in a lovely world. As such, we have always to qualify lines addressing our relation to capital when we call for jobs and wages, uh, when those arguments are had, uh, we have to declare that those are servitude relations. Uh, and I'm not saying to start out by saying, do you know you're living in a servant and an enslaved <laughs> relation? You know, but some form of bringing up the idea that all people, all of us, you, I, we all deserve pleasant living. Meaning, you know, there's all kinds of language that people have used <laughs> together to draw on those as our tactics for organizing, as our pleasure for organizing. Our aim is to undercut that relationship into what the Soviet structure is always intended by revolutionary structure, at least by revolutionary thinking and talking about. We want the whole thing. We make it all, it's all ours, we want that's what we want to get back when we say we want to take our democracy back and all that bullshit. It's not to take back the stole the the the, uh, the uh, structures that didn't mean what they said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks. Anybody else? Michelle, your mic is open. Oh, hello. Thank you, Dee, and thank you, Mark. Uh, I just wanted to express my appreciation for the shout out to teachers, uh, being a teacher and being an activist in the teachers union. Um, just my experience when I sort of got involved in 
left wing politics, a response from people was like, well, it's, you know, it's great you're a teacher, but teachers can't really be revolutionary because they're not industrial. I feel like there's still some prejudice there, um, you know, that we're not part of the real working class. Mm -hmm. And I'm really, I just, I wanted to express my happiness for seeing us in bold type on that slide there. So that was really nice. Um, I think that, you know, some of that is, is gendered as well. And I think that anything that we can do to be leaders on the issue that, you know, you know, women's organizations, women's unions or professions that are heavily female um, definitely are part of the anti-capitalist struggle um, is something that is very important for us. So I just wanted to express my appreciation mm -hmm. for seeing that. Thanks, Mark. Sure. A okay. few more. Okay, a couple more and then we'll move on. Okay. Zachary, your mic is open. All right, can you hear me fine? Yes. All right, wonderful. Um, as for what limits the power of the workers, um, and I guess it goes into what gets in the way of, of the unity, what I've seen the the most is, is the old-time union laborers. Um, a lot of people talk about the decline of unions from, you know, the the, the 70s, 80s on. Oh, we got to look further, further back. It's been a decline since the 50s. Our party was led in most of the unions, or at least members led the unions. Uh, you know, the Wobblies, they were killed. You know, they were persecuted to almost disbandment, you know, in, in the 30s and 40s. So oh the the old time the old guard those have capitulated to democratic the democratic party that's what that's what's in our way that's what i see is in our way okay so what Thanks. we can move forward is is suggesting you know unions are good and all we need to do more we got we got to get that, that idea that there's more to do than just be in a union and ask for a better mm -hmm. wage and benefits mm -hmm. okay all right, should we move on or there's is there another hand there? One more. Okay. Lowell, your mic is open. Thank you. Um, first, I apologize. I missed the first 10 minutes of your presentation, Mark. I rushed home from work to be here. Um, but two points to your question as far as one, what limits the power of workers. I would say kind of piggybacking on what I think it was Zachary just before me um, was alluding to is for me the things that the left does to inhibit the development of workers um the things that the i mean in, in the biggest example which he also alluded to is how we seem to be stuck in this every four years every two years let's find the least offensive or most tolerable Democrat to um, support and fill with adulation and et cetera, et cetera. This doesn't develop the workers at all. Um, this is this is a religious experience, you know, if you will, where you are taking the power, uh, taking the development potential of the workers, which needs to be nurtured. Um, I think it was Michelle who said she's a teacher. I'm a former teacher, and I know that knowledge and understanding don't spring forth from the forehead like Athena from Zeus's forehead. They, they need to be nurtured, and exercises happen, and that's how you develop workers, and that's something that's party. That's what drew me initially, um, among many things, this party is that historically, we were the ones doing that. We were engaged in that and not fooled by Wall Street parties who, yes, can do good things for us, yes, can maybe ease the noose around our necks, but they are not our allies. They are not our allies in this class struggle. As far as examples, um, I'm a federal worker, and as I think you just alluded to, I heard you as I was logging on talking about the shutdown. Mm -hmm. um, me and my coworkers went through 35 days and it was a emotional um, um i was one of the workers me and my co-workers who had to go to work and so we were forced to go to work not knowing when we would be paid now as far as 
the lessons that I'm drawing from that that I keep harping on to my coworkers and elsewhere is that what ended that shutdown was labor. It was it was my 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 coworkers who organized um, sick outs, call outs. It was the air traffic controllers in particular who organized call outs, and then it was the president of the um, mm -hmm. air traffic, not air traffic, the uh, flight attendant association, right. Sarah Nelson. Oh my God, this woman should be president. This woman is the woman who we should be drafting as president. I mean, her her cognizance of what labor is going through is just so beautiful. When she came out several times calling for a general strike and saying that her workers would stop coming to work, that's what ended the shutdown. That's labor power. But more specifically, Mark, this was an exercise. This was an exercise in our power that what I'm seeing the left doing is they're, they keep shifting it to what Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer did, what Congress did, what how so and so in Congress bested Donald Trump. That's not empowering the labor movement. That's disempowering. That's disempowering them. What you're doing to them, well, I should say us, and that's and I think your other caller was correct. This is our struggle. What this is doing to us is that it, it impedes our development to the bigger struggle that we have to fight. And these are not struggles that Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer or Cory Booker or Kamala Harris or even um, Elizabeth Warren are going to fight. This is our fight. It's been our fight since 1919. We need to lead this fight, and this needs to be crystal clear in the introduction, which it is not. That's my two cents. Thank you, Mark. All right, thanks. Okay, I'm going to move on a little bit to, to talk about the, the need for unity, uh, which several of the speakers referenced, the struggle against racism, the struggle for women's rights. The U.S. working class, like the overall U.S. population, is one of the most diverse in the whole world. Um, there is no white working class separate and apart from other kinds of workers. Uh, we're, we're all in this together. Everybody doesn't understand that, but that is the reality, uh, regardless of what the pundits say or the way in which uh, pollsters like to divvy up sections of the population. So working class unity requires unity, unity across many lines used to divide us, race, gender, age, nationality, language, region, politics, wage level, education. Um, it requires solidarity, which means in part the support of all workers for the demands of different groups to address their specific kinds of oppression and exploitation. And it means first of all a working class movement that becomes more anti-racist, anti-sexist, and anti-homophobic. And engaging, our view, I think, is that engaging in social and cross-class struggles doesn't compete with working class struggles, but can strengthen them through unity and solidarity. Sometimes people want to uh, pit class struggle and organization against intersectionality or against other movements of the oppressed or against broad electoral coalitions which cross class lines of necessity. And the point is to understand how they're intertwined, to understand the, the relative importance of, of each and which are fundamental and which are temporary, um, but how we see them as um, uh, you know, so just a side trip into Marxist philosophy that uh, the world is a complex of processes which mutually interact. None of these things are separate from each other and they impact upon each other. And that's part of the idea of the program is to help us understand those interconnections and intersections and interrelationships. And the working class and its organization is diverse. There are more kinds of people organized in the labor movement than in other progressive and people's organizations. Our multiracial, multi multinational, multilingual, multigender, multigenerational working class, that is us. And workers from oppressed groups 
can often be the bridge between the labor movement and progressive organizations who are working on many issues. Women's groups, civil rights group, uh, groups of many kinds, student coalitions, uh, electoral coalitions, all of those, that the, the, uh, the diversity and the breadth of the working class can be the glue that helps hold those struggles together and makes them broader and links them to the fundamental economic issues of society. There are more African Americans organized in the labor movement than in civil rights organizations, more women in labor than in organized women's organizations, and this holds true over just about uh, all ca categories of people. The labor movement even smaller than it should be or smaller than it needs to be, even shrunk from what it, as a percentage of the population from what it once was, is still the biggest struggle organiz uh, set of struggle organizations we have and the most diverse. It's not that the labor movement is better. All the movements are important and have unique roles. And, but all these movements need broad unity to win victories and need the working class as part of that broad unity in order to win victories. And the working class needs to unite in itself. And that requires broad unity and support for the needs and struggles of all. Um, so, but there are key differences between direct working class struggle and other progressive struggles. Many kinds of progressive struggles can result in positive change, election of better politicians or winning a, a law or a policy in many arenas. Social and legal changes can happen. Uh, and those can happen from all kinds of progressive struggles, electoral struggles, legislative struggles, community struggles. But only working class struggle can result in major changes in the economic system in favor of workers, the vast majority. Things like a significant increase in the minimum wage, family leave policies and laws, guaranteed sick leave, pension rights, wage increases for workers, major changes in policy to shift the tax burden back towards the wealthy and the corporations, all the way up to the fundamental economic restructuring of society, eliminating capitalism and building socialism. So that's, there are things that are the same between working class organizations and working class struggles and many other kinds. There are also things which are unique only to the working class struggles. So the, the program talks about class and democratic struggle. That class struggle is foundational. The struggle at the heart of the ca capitalist system, the kind of conflict that will ultimately lead to transformational change, not just in one policy or one politician or another, but a fundamental transformation of the economic basis of society. Democratic struggle is about everyone having a say, everyone having uh, civil rights guaranteed, everyone having part of decision-making power, and about being able to organize for progressive change. So these two kinds of struggles are intertwined because class struggle is in part about workers gaining more democratic power democratic power in the workplace, democratic power in their communities, and democratic power at every level of government. Democratic struggle is in part about the vast majority who are workers being equal before the law, having a say in making decisions, and having the right to struggle and to organize. All class struggles are part of the democratic struggle, but democratic struggles are not limited to class struggle. Uh, when class issues, for example, efforts to increase the minimum wage become part of legislative battles, that's one place where these struggles intertwine. And while democratic struggles against oppression are not strictly class issues, they certainly affect many members of our class. They are struggles against oppression that affects workers and affects members of those oppressed groups, no matter their class. So some people want to say, why not just stick to democratic struggle? Well, there's a number of reasons. Democratic struggle by itself won't lead to progress for workers. It won't organize workers as workers. It doesn't necessarily or automatically speak to the needs of workers. It won't, uh, of its own, move beyond bourgeois democracy and limited reforms. 
democratic struggle by itself won't demand fundamental economic change. Democratic struggle will tend to treat all areas of civil society as equal, unless the organized power of workers acts as a counterbalance to the role of money, economic power, and the inertia of the status quo. Uh, that inertia, I'll just link back to one comment about the fear of change, the fear of struggle, the fear that they instill in us, that it's, it's risky. And it is indeed risky to try and challenge the status quo. So there's a, a, a built-in weight to keeping things the way they are that has to be overcome. And democratic struggle that is linked to class issues and organization will lead to more fundamental progress all across the board. Uh, some people say, well, you know, the heck with this democratic struggle stuff. We should just stick to class struggle. But the democratic struggle is the field upon which working class forces unite with many others, other class forces, progressive movements of many kinds, even some temporary vacillating allies. Uh, the democratic struggle is in part about protecting and defending the right to struggle. Some of the attacks on uh, democracy that we're experiencing right now are on the right to vote, on the a right to have a say in the decisions that affect our lives. But some of them are about the right to protest, the right to organize, the right to, uh, you know, there have been bills introduced in state legislatures around the country for things like uh, making it uh, legal for uh, a car to run down a protester, for demanding that organizers of protests can't get permits unless they have some gigantic insurance policy for uh, putting hoops, making it uh, diff you know, more difficult for us to fight for our rights. So the democratic struggle is in part about defending the right of the working class to organize, to struggle, and to demonstrate. As well, if we if workers don't engage in the democratic struggle, that seeds that whole arena to the capitalist class. It gives them a clear field to spread lies, to frame issues, to use demagogy, and to use the government to attack workers' rights. We're sort of handing handing a weapon to our opponents if we don't engage in the democratic struggle as part of our efforts in the class struggle. The democratic struggle is where issues of concern to the vast majority get framed, debated, and struggled. Work, it's the place where workers, unions, and the labor movement as a whole unites with other progressive forces. It's where we can unite with others to address issues of concern to everybody but the 1%. And it's where the power of workers and the power of broad unity can be brought to bear on the entire capitalist class, not just one region or one employer, but the whole system. Uh, and it's where many issues about oppression, discrimination, and disparate impacts are debated and solutions are fought for. And it's one way in which workers can demonstrate their support for the demands of oppressed groups and other progressive causes. So we think, and the draft argues, that democratic struggle at present is the path to uniting the widest, deepest coalition to stop fascism and administer a decisive defeat to the extreme right. There's another reason that uh, democratic struggle is crucial. Uh, it connects us to a main thread of progressive U.S. history which in part is a series of mass struggles to protect and extend democracy. The Constitution, it took a struggle to demand that the Bill of Rights be included in the Constitution, that the right to freely assemble, the right to free speech were included in the Constitution. That took a struggle on the part of people who were opposed to the Constitution being adopted unless it included those rights. The Civil War was a battle against slavery and to extend the voting franchise. Women's organizations waged an over 90 year struggle to win the right to vote for women. Much of workers struggles to organize in the 1930s to win social security, unemployment insurance, the right, even the right to organize was a democratic struggle to realize some of the promises of the constitution and the, and the declaration of independence. 
uh, the fight that our party waged throughout the Mc McCarthy period to protect the democratic rights of all to express those opinions and the right to organize to create change was a democratic struggle, one that was not just for our benefit, was, but was for the benefit of all society. The civil rights movement waged a fight for the right to vote, to eliminate poll taxes, and to eliminate other obstacles to the right to vote. Uh, the anti-Vietnam War movement played a big uh, role in the struggle to lower the voting age to 18. And the battles we are engaged in now against Trumpism and the steps towards fascism uh, are part of this history, historical trend of uh, our culture, our history, our politics, our society. So there are innumerable reasons for us to link workers' struggles to the fights to protect and extend democracy and for, for full civil rights, even though those struggles by themselves won't lead to socialism. So what are your questions or comments? I want to throw the floor open for comments and questions. Okay, the floor is open if you want to comment on that section. Use your the picture of your hand, click your raised hand icon. Gary Mueller, your mic is open. Open your mic on your end, click your mic on your end. Gary Mueller. Gary Mueller. Okay, I'm closing Gary Mueller for now. And looking for another hand. Rick, your mic is open. Rick, your mic is open. Oh, thank you, Dee. Uh, yes, and I want to thank Mark for the presentation today and the wonderful work that the committee that he's been heading up has done. And I think that this last point that he uh, has been raising about democratic and the link between democratic and class struggles is really a, the richest part of our program and is the area where there is, is the most interesting discussions to be had. And I just wanted to share a struggle that's taking place here in Cleveland right now. Uh, we have one newspaper in our city, basically, and that's the Plain Dealer, which has been taken over by, which is owned by a, a corporation based, I don't know where, in, in other states. And th this corporation, which is called Advanced Corporation, announced a union busting plan to outsource the jobs of the reporters and headline writers and copy editors to technicians in other states. And so not only would this be an attack on the workers and, the, and good union jobs in our city, but also it means that the local coverage that we enjoy in this newspaper would be severely undermined. So at our last Central Labor Council meeting, we decided to set up a solidarity committee to reach out to the community and to reach out to all the people that are going to be affected by this inferior coverage, that local coverage that we'll have. So we're going to reach out to the to the sports teams that every the professional sports teams that we're very proud of in Cleveland, you know, the Cavs and the Browns and the um, Indians. <coughs> Indians, as well as to their unions. We're going to reach out to the where we have wonderful medical facilities in Cleveland, Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals and Metro Health. And we're going to reach out to them as well as to the uh, unions and the hospitals. The cultural writers at the Plain Dealer held a big concert last weekend uh, and 10 groups came in, the, in, which many of them were organized into the Musicians Union. And they had a wonderful concert with 500 people to raise understanding about this struggle that the plain dealer workers are involved in. And so, and we have, you know, wonderful cultural institutions like the Cleveland Orchestra, which is a mem the members of the orchestra are in the mu Musicians Union. So we're reaching out to the cultural institutions as well as their unions. And even to the business community, like Mark said, this is a multi-class issue because it means that business coverage in the Cleveland Plain Dealer will be undercut. So, you know, all the unions, the steel workers and auto workers, and as well as the 
big business, big corporations that are based in Cleveland have an interest in stopping this attack on the on the unionized workers at the News Guild and, and the plane dealer. And of course, also the government employees and the government public officials also have an interest in maintaining and preserving this local coverage. So I think that, you know, it just shows what, what you've been saying, that, that there's just a total intermingling of the class struggle to protect these this particular group of workers who are fighting for their jobs and, and how it connects with the entire community. And in order to win this fight, it's going to take the, that kind of unity. So that's what we're trying to set up with. Thank you. Thanks. A few more. Tom Connolly, your mic is open. Hi, uh, this is Tom Connolly. How are you doing, Mark? You're doing a Thanks. great job. You and the committee are really appreciate what you're trying to do here. Thanks. I'm a chair of my club, my labor club, and we're trying to decipher uh, this into some kind of summary and uh, so that we can take it forward. But I, the, the part that really I liked about it was when you talk about the party, there's a particular one paragraph I'll read real quickly here. Our party makes important contributions to the struggle to defeat the extreme right. Communists clarify who the main enemy is, what the class and political nature of the enemy is, and the need for an all people's front. Communists help unite the core forces of the uh, alliance around the labor movement. Uh, we bring a high level of commitment, devotion, and activity to the struggle. There's a couple of points here where you pull out what the party is. So I think if we go through it and look at those points, because uh, I'm speaking to people that are not Marxists, mm -hmm. our members, some of our members have never read anything. They came to our, our party because of the nature of uh, the, the labor struggles and community struggles and the legislative struggles that we're in. So they have never read it. So when we talk about, when you say the party, it's, I think I'm, you know, this is my first read of it. I said, I'm trying to figure out what I can use to summarize. I like this part, the Communist Party approach to electoral politics and is the basic aspect of our view uh, that the current stage of struggle re, uh, requires an all people's front to defeat the extreme right, et cetera. Those kind of comments can grab, people can grab onto. And then we can start moving you know, in a way, I think that uh, uh, some of the some of the terminology and the wording here, I can send it to you is a little bit much. And some <laughs> of your comments that I think, you know what I'm saying? Not for oh, yeah. been around a long time. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get this for people that I'm working with and trying to recruit to the party that uh, have not had the Marxist experience as many of the older comrades have had. And I'm old also, by the way. So it's it's uh trying to sort that out but i do like the way you you worded that i want to compliment you on that and this is the first read and this is what we're trying to do in our club so we're trying and, and as we work it through i'll be glad to share what other other our other comrades in our club are saying and thank, thank you again for your work I, I know how difficult this is yeah well thank you it sounds like i mean the very point that the point of the draft not, not necessarily the point of the final program, but the point of the draft is to allow the party itself to wrestle with our role, our strategy, what our clubs can do, how we can implement this, what the obstacles in the way, how, just sort of, and how the the current moment is connected to the long term. Sounds like that's exactly what you're trying to do. So I hope this helps in the process. Other comments? Bradley, your mic is open. You have to click your mic on your end in order to click this. Yes, there you are. Hi, Hi. I'm Brad from Indiana. I have uh, just one question. In the initial uh, discussions, there was talk about how the executive summary would be a standalone type of document. And I just wanted to clarify what would be the uses of that as a standalone document how would that um how would how would having that portion be a standalone document um be advantageous 
Well, the, the, the main one is that one of the main critiques of the previous program was that it was too long for popular use. When people wanted to have an idea of what our strategy was, that we give them an 80-page pamphlet, it's, um, it's just too much to expect that very many people will read the whole thing. It was too in inaccessible to have the whole thing. Um, and so it, it wasn't as useful as it could be. Uh, we couldn't see how to shorten the whole program because there's just so much we have to cover. But we thought that having the introduction uh, as a standalone piece uh, would provide some of that, uh, just an introduction, a shorter summary of the whole, which people could actually use to give to people. And it wouldn't be so long that it would be daunting or just ignored. That was our hope. Marcy, did you, did you say something? Yes, can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you, but there's an echo. Yeah, hold on one moment. I got to take myself off of something. Sorry. I have a house full of people here with me one moment. Let me turn this down. Okay, we're going to close your phone. Sounds like you have two devices running. Okay, we'll come back to Marcy. Um, we'll come back to you, Mar uh, Marcy. Michael, your, your mic is open. Michael. Oh. Yes, this is Mike again from Indiana. I think it was a great, great section you were talking about, the, uh, the relationship between class struggle and democratic struggles and all of this. But I do hope one thing. I know that we're, we're talking a lot about the, the final transformation or the trans, uh, radical trans, things leading up to a radical transformation in the future. I think it's important that we put in the document, and maybe it's there because I have to admit I just scanned over the document. I really haven't read it yet. Uh, mm -hmm. Some information about the ultimate goal. And that ultimate goal would be, of course, the overthrow of capitalism in a classless society where everybody could have the opportunity to expand all their talents. And that may be in there. But I think we need something kind of dramatic like that in the document itself to say, well, well it's all, all it's leading. It's not just leading to, you know, the type of reforms we had before, but it's going to go beyond that into a future society. So uh, I just kind of want to make sure that maybe uh, something like that would be put in the document itself. And maybe it's there already. Maybe I just don't know. Yeah, uh, Thank you. It, there, there, there is a section on socialism, uh, and there will be one of that will be the subject of one of the three future webinars that we're doing. Okay, let me try Marcy again. Okay, Marcy. Hi. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm sitting here. There's a bunch of us here. Uh, we have a wonderful representative. It's gonna be. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, there's there's a big echo. I don't know where it is. I'm not sure why that's happening. Okay, could you go on and say whatever it is? Okay, do you have two machines running? I have my I have television. My computer, so I'll turn off the television. Well, something sounds something echoes like that when you have two machines. Is that better? Uh, yes. Okay. Hold on just a moment. All right. Go ahead. Mama Evie, do you want to make your statement? Just from where she is? Yes. They can you hear can you. speak now. Oh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> can you hear? Yes, we yes, can hear. Can hear. Okay. I um, worked in factories and I worked in as a teacher and I have a couple of experiences that I thought would be interesting and maybe we can all learn from. Uh, when I was teaching there was a, the teachers had a, a, <clears throat> a lot of the, the class size was much too large and uh, the wages were much too low and so the teachers decided to go on strike. And uh, when we were on strike, uh, I talked to my students 
about that students ask me different questions and I went into why people strike, et cetera. So they got so in interested and involved that they got their parents to come out and go on the picket line with us. And the kids themselves went on the picket line after school. So uh, I thought that uh, this was a very good experience so that when we uh, have experiences like this and talk to other people, we can enlarge it and educate people as we go along, not only within our own little group. The second uh, experience uh, that, uh, by the way, and we we got uh, we won some very good things. Uh, the sure. other experience is um, uh, when you work when I was working in the shipyard during. Uh, uh, and uh, there were very uh, many uh, dangerous areas uh, uh, when it, wherever we had to, you know, to go uh, uh, work. And so <clears throat> near where I work, uh, there was a bucket filled with crystals. And in the morning, the, some guys came to fill their buckets to wherever they worked, but on the bucket, on the big uh, barrel, it said, be very careful of danger. And we worked hard to tell them, the uh, our bosses, that that should be taken away from where people are gathering. So they didn't bother. But one day, one of the crystals happened to fall on a person's uh, hand, and he blew up a flames in front of my face. It was horrible. And so what I'm saying is there's also a struggle to for safety in the workplace. And uh, I thought that that was an experience that people should should look to to safety in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Thank you for letting me express myself. Certainly. Thank you, Certainly. Thank you, Mavidi. Thank you, guys. What more, Mark? Are you? Uh, let's get there. Well, let, one, one uh, let's, let's, let's take well, one or two more, and then we'll finish up. John, your mic is open. John Millman, your mic is open. Milam, uh, yes. Uh, I'm from uh, East Central Ohio, and I just had a few points. I think uh, you've covered a lot of territory, and uh, I uh, bang, did a bang-up job. But I think for points of clarity, there needs to be a clear uh, idea of strategy and tactics is one of the two things that what is the ultimate strategy of the party which i would envision uh putting all power which it would be economic political military state power in the hands of the working class and tactics would be the things we do to uh move toward that goal one of them is of course supporting uh an increase in democracy, even on the bourgeois democracy of uh, under capitalism. And uh, as far as uh, democracy, uh, well, that's pretty much it. I'll try to cut it short. Okay. Well, thank you. I have not been too clear, but uh, thank you for letting me say my piece. Certainly. Good job, Mark. Thank you. Uh, there's nobody else. I'll move on to to wrap up here. Uh, so one of the things we want to do is that there are many ways for you to contribute to the program. The pro, not just directly to the wording, but to the meaning of it. One is to study the draft program yourself. Another is to participate in the 
next three webinars uh, on different aspects of the program. We decided to 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 sort of pick uh, four broad themes. Uh, another is to discuss the draft draft in your club or study group. Uh, you can submit amendments or suggestions about wording or other editorial changes directly to the program drafting committee uh, by sending us an email to program at cpusa.org. And I will note that the more specific you can make your suggestions, the better. If you can reference page numbers, paragraphs, especially if you can bold your suggestions. Some people have already sent us new texts and it, without, uh, it's very difficult to do a word-to-word -word comparison of different drafts, especially when we're getting many suggestions from many people. But we do welcome all those. You can write short or long pieces which discuss and debate political concepts or propose political changes to the draft and submit it as part of the pre-convention discussion uh, at our website, cpusa.org. You can become a delegate to the convention and participate in the final decision-making process. And most importantly, you can participate in our work to carry out the program, to implement the strategy. That's part of our democratic centralism is the activity of our members. I just want to also note that if it would help in, uh, in your club or your study group or for yourself, if you would like a copy of this PowerPoint, you can just send a request for that to program at cpusa.org and I'll send you a copy of this. So I think that wraps us up. We're a little over an hour. Maybe, uh, Dee, did you want to uh, promote the next webinar? No, I think we need to promote more discussion. We've got at least, uh, what, uh, a little over 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, so, Michelle, I'm going to open your mic uh, because Michelle uh, um, volunteered to be a uh, discussant of this uh, issue. Very good. All right. Thanks, Dee. Um, I... I think this has been a really great discussion. I'm I'm happy with the, the points people are raising. I really connect deeply with this part of our program. Um, I think it's one of the jewels of our party is the fact that we have such a rich, rich history with the, um, the democratic struggles. And I did, I, I kind of um, put together something that's probably too long to read, but I just, I have a few points I wanted to pull out of it just because I got, really into taking some notes on this today. And I think that, um, you know, when we talk about the democratic struggle, sometimes it feels like when people discuss it, they fall back on democratic struggles versus class struggle. And I think it's good that we are making the, the point that they are linked. And I think that it um, it's really important that we bring people into that. I think when, um, especially when I'm talking to people who are kind of new to anti-capitalism, they feel like the democratic struggles can either be saved until after some future date when we overthrow capitalism or that it's just kind of like, um, it's not special enough to work on or it's, you know, it's not key or it's secondary. And I think the, the more that we can emphasize that that is not the case, the better in my view. Um, I really love Henry Winston's book, Strategy for a Black Agenda, uh, especially in the section where he talks about the anti-slavery movement and uh, Frederick Douglass and his strategies for anti-slavery. There's this great quote that, those who do not understand the role of coalition in the people's fight to improve their condition fail to see the relationship between reforms and revolution. Um, and it just, uh, you know, some of the anti-slavery activists of Frederick Douglass's time actually tried to argue, you know, that pursuing reforms or participating in the elections uh, would actually be a betrayal of their principles of total abolishment of slavery. And um, they fell into a lot of sectarianism and isolation over that. And as we know, this is like a key struggle in our history. Um, and many Marxists were actually contemporary with this struggle. You know, it, was not, it doesn't predate Marxism at all. It's, you know, people were there and they were actually fighting in this struggle and they made it a key part of um, their strategy that, you know, they had to pursue the broadest coalition, uh, which meant working in the elections, 
you know, reaching out to reform groups, um, things that didn't necessarily seem revolutionary, um, you know, were, were super important. And that was the, the key to eventual victory. Um, I just thought this was pretty interesting. Um, this is a quote from Friedrich Sorge, who wrote Labor Movement in the United States. Um, and he talks about how the first Marxist clubs in the United States were these were called the communist clubs, and they were founded around the 1850s. Um, they were the only socialist or worker organizations to admit you know, black people as full and equal members. And their constitutions required all members to recognize the complete equality of everybody, no matter what color or sex. So that was pretty advanced, but you know, they're still working with uh, white workers who were, as they said, indifferent to abolition. Um, they said, because, you know, which seems rather shocking, that concentration on that issue, on abolishing slavery, would divert attention from the more basic issue, the abolition of wage slavery, um, which is just a shocking quote to read in retrospect. But I think sometimes that attitude, you know, can come to contemporary struggles where even in the election two years ago, you know, I had people who, you know, were, you know, fight, fighting the anti-monopoly struggle and they're just like, your issues are secondary. You know, there's no reason to go after things like abortion, you know, to win rights for reproductive justice or, you know, take on other issues that are maybe more gendered or race-based because those things aren't real class struggle. And I think they can be alienating to people when you live that life and your issues are economic and they are they are part of your class oppression and i think that we also have to just be really careful on how we provide leadership word things be sensitive and work in coalitions to just make this the broadest based coalition that we can so i get really passionate about this subject so sorry if my voice is shaking but <laughs> that, that that was kind of what i was my thoughts were on that issue so thank you for surfacing this discussion thank you joe your mic will be opened in a second joe in a second now your mic is open joe Okay, I don't have to click on it. No, nope. okay. we can hear uh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I appreciated very much the work of the uh, uh, committee that wrote the program and uh, Mark's uh, introduction uh, today. Um, just to follow up uh, a moment on what uh, Michelle had just said and others uh, spoke to, um, I think that one of the great points about the program is that it puts forward the idea that the um, struggle for equality uh, of African Americans, Latino, Asians, women, LGBTQ people are essential parts of the struggle for equality. And now let me rephrase that, the struggle for democracy, that the struggle for e e equality of people of color, women, LGBTQ people is a basic part of the struggle for democracy. Um, and uh, the struggle for rights, for equal rights. Um, and that's really Im important today because I think that the main form uh, that the right wing is using to attack that is through uh, going after what they call identity politics, you know? Um, and, um, and they make the uh, uh, argument that um, identity politics uh, 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 is somehow a, a uh, diversion from uh, basic people's uh, uh, struggles. And I think that one of the things that, that the uh, a party uh, upholds is, is that rather than it be a diversion, that the fight for equality is a really important part of, of, of unifying people, you know, um, all up and down the, the line, black and white, um, uh, Asian, Latino, and so on and so forth, women. 
And that without such unity, you know, both the class struggle can't proceed um, the right way, nor can the uh, struggle for equality uh, win the kinds of successes that are uh, necessary. Um, and that's a really important issue, uh, particularly on the uh, left. Um, and uh, I, I think that Michelle spoke to that. Well, last point I want to make is that these struggles, you know, if you think about it, have a revolutionary democratic potential. Um, and, you know, it's hard to say how socialism will come to this country, you know, what struggle will produce it. It could be an environmental struggle, you know, it could be uh, an issue of, uh, uh, of choice, it could be police brutality, it could be a strike, you know, it's hard to say. Um, and I think that the program also, uh, when it speaks to the and Mark also, when he spoke to the interconnectedness of all of these different struggles, it, uh, that's the kind of point that we were trying to make. The last thing I want to say is that these movements are independent, you know. Um, uh, they have their own, they set their own agendas, you know. Um, they uh, take their own decisions, and it's important for all of us who are involved in this coalition work that we speak of to uh, recognize uh, that. So um, the struggle for democracy is a really important part of our overall uh, movement, directly related to the class struggle. Um, and I think that our approach is to have a, you know, a balanced uh, assessment uh, uh, and, and a fight for unity uh, as we go forward. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see if, if Gary will. Gary uh, Mueller, just click on your mic and you there you are. Now Hi speak. There. Hey there. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, what wonderful, everything was, was so informatory. But um, I just wanted to go back earlier where you were talking about inspirational moments, if I might. Mm -hmm. And the one that comes to my mind is about two to three years ago, um, there were some younger people in my office and they were showing me a thing called the Univision Contest, which is a large musical contest in Europe. <laughs> And um, they showed me what they wanted to show me, and the YouTube video kept playing. And while we were talking, a new uh, contestant came on, and there was a couple of uh, uh, musical beats, and then all of a sudden, the entire audience went crazy. And the kids that I was with were uh, looking at it going, what is this? You know, And they're trying to make heads or tails out of it. The song that was being played was the International. <laughs> and the kids that I was with had no concept of what this was. And uh, and so I did just a really brief little, well, this is what it is and this is what it means. And the interest was amazing, but for them to see in a, in a world that they're immersed in, the European music and all, this tremendous interest in this song, uh, I, I got uh, actual goosebumps. <laughs> Gary, we lost your audio. Gary, okay, Gary has closed his mic. Well, and thanks for his comments. Okay, Bradley, your mic is open. Bradley, Lord, Lord. Yeah. Um, Mark, I wanted to uh, thank you. Uh, really excellent job. And my only question uh, it actually relates to that. Uh, is it possible to get a, co a copy of this PowerPoint that you've, uh, you guys have created? Uh, yes. If you send a request 
to program at cpusa.org uh, and specify the this uh, this PowerPoint. I'll send you a copy. That would be great. That would be great. Thank you very much. Marcy, your mic is open. Hi, I just want to mention everything is wonderful. I'm just very excited about the whole draft, um, having something, a tool. But I also wanted to mention that um, I called her Mama, Mama Edie. She is 97 years old and joined the party when she was 14. Um, I'm hoping that she'll be one of the people that I do my documentary on for the convention. I want to take a 14-year-old and have her, have her answer some questions. <laughs> Very so cool. I just wanted to put that out there for you guys, let you know. We got a 97-year-old. She's got a lot of knowledge. I'm going to pick her brain. <laughs> Very cool. One more. Let's see. Zemayan, Zemayan, Dale, your mic is open. Zemian, Z-E-M-A-Y-A-N, your mic is open. Yep. Not, not hearing it. Just a second. Zimian, your mic is open. Zimian, Zimian. Dale, your mic is open. Okay, uh, we can, we may as well move to, I will let everyone know that our next uh, class is March 24th. Uh, 6 o'clock p.m. Uh, Eastern, and we will continue uh, this discussion by delving a little more into uh, the composition of the U.S. working class and the relationship between the U.S. working class and other progressive forces in, in, the, in the fight for uh, uh, social advancement. So, Mark, do you have any concluding remarks you'd like to make? Um, just, just I much appreciate the the discussion that we've had, and look forward to a lot more of it. And your contributions and thoughts on the program are welcome. Um, just want to note that just as class struggle can't be reduced to just the struggle for wages, so too democratic struggle can't be reduced to only electoral campaigns. We are talking about these things as broad concepts and uniting many kinds of struggle. That often the question is posed, are, are you for reform or revolution? And our point is that the way to revolutionary struggle is through struggles for reforms. That's how we win people. That's how we win trust. That's how we build alliances through the process of the struggle for reforms, as long as we don't see the reforms as an end in themselves. And uh, as I think, as many people have commented, one of our party's unique contributions is the fight for unity. That's one of the things that distinguishes us from many other left groups. That's a, a, a key aspect of, of our identity in the movements that we work with, always fighting for unity, always fighting to connect it to the bigger picture, always fighting to build alliances, always fighting to overcome the divisions. And I hope that our program clearly states that and uh, explains it well and that you and many, many others will join us in the process of creating that fundamental change. So thank you very much. 
Okay, thanks everyone for joining us. We will resume our discussion on March 24th. We hope we look forward to your participation that evening and bring along many of your uh, friends and contacts. So thank you, Mark, and thank you everyone else. Good night. Thanks, Dee.